yeah so welcome everybody to the special uh, biology physics theory colloquium today and uh, this is something that we have been in keep keeping in mind especially because uh, this g minus 2 is certainly one of the most famous precision tests of the standard model which is probably the most accurate theory known to human beings uh, it can predict almost uh, anything to uh, any fundamental process to one part in a million and sometimes one part in a billion and uh, with accuracy so it's uh, something that is completely unprecedented and it's rather quite unpoetically called standard model <laughs> uh, so then in april 7 we have this exciting news that uh, that g minus 2 of the muon may not be exactly what standard model predicts but there's a lot of controversy especially about theory and that is what we will hear today and uh, our speaker today is uh, Ananta Narayan, who is very well known. Uh, he has, uh, the first important thing is that he is an alumnus from IIT Madras in chemical engineering in the 1970s. And uh, so I think he has been uh, very enthusiastic, especially about giving talk to us, particularly because of this reason. And it's a real pity that he's not in our campus today and but that we will have him sometime soon. And uh, well, he has, uh, been one of the pillars of the high energy physics community in, in India, and uh, he has worked on uh, various aspects of technology, uh, especially uh, with respect to QCD, low energy QCD, and uh, also like testing. Uh, I think he has worked on the pion radius and, and also about many of these QCD effects in collider physics and various aspects of collider physics, including supersymmetric. Uh, testing supersymmetric extensions of the standard model and so on and so forth. And he has also recently worked on, recently been working on many of the fundamental properties of fundamental diagrams and, uh, and like this fundamental properties of scattering amplitudes where he has made very interesting breakthroughs. Maybe we should have another talk by him to listen to those kind of things that he's working on. And generally I think on more modern versions of the effective field theory methods. So, Today, he will be talking to us about this famous G minus two controversy. And we are very happy that you have this wonderful colloquium uh, then by him, because he has been one of the major players here, including he has, his work has now made it to the white, uh, white paper of this, uh, uh, of the, from the theory perspective. So, okay, so uh, over to you then, Anand. And yeah. Thank you so much for such a, such a kind and, uh, and uh, effusive introduction. I feel honored and it's actually the first time that I would be speaking at any talk in IIT Madras since the time I graduated. I was there from 1980 to 85. I was in the last five-year batch of the BTEC program, which I think was a phenomenal program. The, the five years actually made a lot of difference. So I think I consider myself very lucky to have been part of that. Uh, so in, uh, in my talk today, I'll tell you about the experiment, which I think is extremely, um, uh, extremely inter interesting and challenging, and in a sense, such a beautiful experiment that I spent a fair amount of time actually reading about it and to figure out how they do this experiment and try to convey the impression that I have about the experiment. And then I'll talk about the theory also and try to tell you where some of the problems may be. Uh, uh, so I have just started the screen share. Is it okay? Is, is it clear? Yes, it is, is perfect. It, it is perfect. Okay. It's perfect. Yes. Okay. So I was wondering how to entitle this talk, and in the final analysis, after I think, after I thought about it, I really think that it was a, it's an example of the theory and the experiment challenging one another. So to that extent, I think that this is the really the most uh, suitable title, where theory and experiment have been going hand in hand. And the, uh, and the uncertainties of the theory and experiment have also been challenging one another. So, uh, so this, I think, actually captures the essence of where we are. And in this challenge today, we see that there is a little bit of tension between the two aspects of theory and the experiment. And um, as more data is, is, uh, is gathered by the Fermilab experiment, and as the uncertainties begin to shrink, perhaps we have the uh, opportunity to see some new physics because at the moment the discrepancy is set to be even over four sigma.
but we claim to have a discovery of new physics or whatever of any effect only when it is this five sigma. So with, with more data coming in, perhaps the uh, discrepancy will uh, go down a little bit. And in fact, this discrepancy of more than four arises when the new Fermilab data results are combined with the existing Brookhaven results, which had a discrepancy a little more than three sigma. And only when you combine them, you get this. But of course, it's legitimate to combine them because these two experimental results with comparable uncertainties are compatible with one another. So statisticians would say that it is actually fair to combine these results to get the kind of discrepancy that we say that we have to be. Uh, why am I not able to scroll down? Ah, okay. So this is the outline of my talk. So I will, uh, the, with, the, with these words of these introduction a little bit more. And I will say a little bit about quantum electrodynamics, which is the theory that uh, I just talked about. But of course, many of the theoretical uncertainties today are not quite coming from the electrodynamic sector, but from the sector where there are hadrons, which you have to somehow model and the effects have to be derived from using other experimental data such as E plus C minus two hadrons. So there is a lot of work in electrodynamics and it's very much under control. That's where the bulk of the contributions come from, but the uncertainties are rather small in the quantum electrodynamics sector. The uncertainties are larger whenever the hadrons are present. So I'll tell you about the G minus two of the muon, what we call anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which is closely related to the gyromagnetic ratio. And the value of two for this uh, is actually predicted by the equation. And so any deviations from that, the Dirac equation predicts this value of two in the classical limit and all the other corrections to this come from quantum mechanical effects. In other words, due to the presence of virtual particles in the, that are produced in the vacuum and disappear back into the vacuum. And therefore you can also have the possibility of having production of particle pairs and interactions, which hide in these loops, which are not described by what we call the standard model. And when we say standard model, of course, we mean the electroweak theory, the electromagnetic and weak theory, which have been combined to give the electroweak theory as well as the strong interactions, which is the theory of quarks and gluons. But at these energies, we can't quite compute anything in quantum dynamics, the theory of quarks and gluons, but rather that it has to be modeled or these uh, uncertainties and contributions have to be evaluated using other experimental inputs. So the two main experiments are the Brookhaven experiment, which concluded in 2004 or so, and the new Fermilab experiment, which was again put together a few years ago and started its running about a year or two ago. And these results are based on the run one of the experiment. Run two and three, I think, are already going on. The data is being collected and analyzed so that we will have better results in the coming, uh, in the coming months and years. So the theoretical challenges, as I mentioned, come from the hydronic sector. And then there are two distinct categories of contributions here. One is called the hadronic vacuum polarization and the other is a hadronic light by light scattering. These are the two sectors from which we get contributions. And we have some work of our own based on methods that we developed also with Sunetra when she was at the Indian Institute of Science. And we have continued and used it to uh, help estimate the hadronic vacuum polarization contributions, then I'll tell you the conclusions and give you an outlook. But just as a word of introduction, because there may be members of the audience who are not elementary particle physicists, just to remind you, a muon is, is also an elementary particle and is like an electron in all respects, except that it is to about 200 and times, 210 times heavier. But it's unstable because of the presence of the weak interactions, which allows the muon to get converted into a, into a neutrino of the muon type and then to simultaneously produce an electron and its antineutrino. So that's why it's unstable. So if you turned off the weak interactions, then the muon would also be absolutely stable and would be exactly like an electron, except that it is more than 200 times as heavy. And there are all parameters of the theory of the standard model. Nobody knows why the electron mass is what it is, or the muon mass is what it is, and so on. So these are external or experimentally determined parameters as far as the theory is concerned. As I mentioned, the 
the muon decays because of the weak interaction. It is also very important to keep in mind that the weak interaction is a maximally pari parity violating interaction whenever it involves the charged current. So this is very crucial because this is one of the principles that goes into the measurement of the anomalous magnetic moment. The fact that it is parity violating is a very important reason why we are able to do these experiments in the first place. That is, we are able to produce polarized muons and use the polarization of the muon, which is measured. How do you measure the properties of the muon? You only measure it from the distributions of its decay products. And because this decay is maximally parity violating, we are able to get information that correlates the decay of the muon with the uh, with its spin properties and how it processes the magnetic field. So the anomalous magnetic movement obviously is related to the precession of the muon in a magnetic field, in a very uniform magnetic field. So both the Brookhaven and the Fermilab experiments require you to have very clean, very precise, determined magnetic fields in which the polarized muons actually process. And it is from this precession frequently which from the distribution of the dot electrons that we actually get information on the anomalous magnetic moment. So it's in that sense that the experiment itself is so very interesting. So obviously the electron interact, the muon interacts electromagnetically since it's uh, electrically charged, but it has no electric dipole moment at any discernible level because the presence of an electric dipole moment at any discernible level would be a signal of leptonic CP violation now, the special theory of relativity says that there are three discrete symmetries present in nature. One is called C, stands for charge conjugation, which means that the laws of physics should be invariant in a world with particles and world with the charge conjugate particles. In other words, whatever laws hold for mu plus should also hold for mu minus suitably uh, interpreted. Then there's another... Um, Discrete symmetry, which is known as parity, which is nothing to do, which is nothing more than the laws of physics in a reflected world, parity. And then finally, the third discrete symmetry is called T or time reversal, which says that the laws of physics should be invariant under the operation of time reversal. But we know that it's not true. Special theory of relativity says that it's the combined operations of CPT that should be actually uh, be, be a law of nature. It doesn't say anything about C, P, and T separately, okay? So CP is an operation that is C followed by P, which we know is violated only in certain strongly interacting particles, namely B mesons and the K mesons. We don't have not seen it in the leptonic sector. By leptons, I mean electrons and neurons of the tau lepton and their corresponding neutrinos. Okay. So these are all the words of, it, of, uh, of uh, introduction that I wanted to say about the muon itself. So the Fermi lab measurement from about 15 or 16 years ago is given is no, no, sorry, the Fermi lab is a recent one is given over here. It's this number. I'd like to also like you to remember these numbers 116, the first three digits, because this shows up a lot and I'll show you in the history of these measurements also that these three numbers, one, one, six, show up. And finally, there's a factor of 10 to the pi of power of minus 11. <clears throat> and this has been determined by Fermilab at the level where the uncertainty, uncertainties are at the level of 3.3 sigma. The Brookhaven National Lab measurement was this, but they give it <laughs> to a different power. So I just wrote it like this, just to say that this is how it appears in the literature where this is given with 10 to the power of minus 10 where this is given with 10 to the power of minus 11. So I'd like you to observe these four numerals over here, 2040 over here, and this particular measurement from Brookhaven, which is 2080, when I write it as 10 to the power of minus 11. That means that the Fermilab measurement, the simple value actually is somewhat lower than the, Brook, than the Brookhaven measurement, rather than 2080 over here, it's 2040. The theory <coughs> measurement actually is even lower than this. It's of the order of about 18, where you see you know, 1880 or so, 
where you see 2040 over here, the theory would show 1880 or so. So you can see that the Brookhaven measurement is significantly larger than the Fermilab measurement. And I will show you pictorially how this looks. <clears throat> Why is this not changing? Ah, okay. Did it jump too much? No. Okay, so I just wanted to list the four important publications that were uh, presented at the time of the April 7th uh, press conference that I had mentioned, and these are the four. One of them is published in Physical Review Letters over here. Okay, this is the theory. No, wait a minute. These are the key references on the paper. These are not uh, key references. Uh, theory references that we have over here, and then I'll show you the book and, and the uh, <coughs> Fermi Lab references also. So the white paper that Ian mentioned is the one that's published over here in physics reports. This is the full theory compilation of all kinds of effects all the way from QED to lattice to hadronic uh, vacuum polarization contributions to hadronic light by light and so on. There are other useful articles for students. There's one by Miller et al, which is published in the annual review of nuclear and particle science from 2012, well before the present, which means that the principles of these experiments have been known for a while. There's a very fat book by Jaeger Lehner, which is called the Anomalous Magnetic Moment of the Muon. And then I also want to draw your attention to the QED part that I mentioned, which is called the 10th order QED contribution here to the electron G minus two. Also it is called the muon, but the electron G minus two also is present over here. But I wanted to make a comment over here on what I was saying about quantum electrodynamics. Now we know, and this was already shown by Dyson long ago, that quantum electrodynamics has actually got a zero radius of convergence. convergence. So any observable that you have, if you write it out as a power series in the strong coupling constant, in the electromagnetic coupling constant alpha, is known to be what is called an asymptotic series. But the nice thing about an asymptotic series is that it converges with a true value at rather low orders in perturbation theory. So having an asymptotic series sometimes can be of uh, great practical use. So essentially the calculations in QED that are done to this order is more or less the end of the game, even though it involves thousands and thousands of diagrams, there's no reason to do this more and more. <clears throat> also want to draw your attention to some more resources where these things are explained very well. So this is the technical design report uh, published in, uh, in, on the archive about six years ago. There are other very nice, um, uh, internet resources, particlebytes.com, Fermilab, it's uh, one of the materials for students to read this about, to read about this. YouTube is a fantastic place to find some of these things. Uh, so, and we are particularly grateful to uh, Stanley Wojcicki, who is himself a, is a part of the physicist experimentalist, is a father of Susan Wojcicki, who is the CEO of YouTube. So you see, so how much his contributions to knowledge are, not just through his work, but also having a daughter as a CEO of YouTube. In the talks of the theorist from April 7th and the experiment list available on YouTube and elsewhere are also of very great importance and it's very well done. So for students who want to follow these talks, they can look at this. Quanta Magazine and Gilberto Colangelo, one of the authors of uh, the white paper gave a colloquium called the Democritos colloquium that he explains very well what the theoretical uncertainties are. So although this is five months ago, four and a half months, nothing much has changed since those times. So you can go back and look at these. Okay, so quantum uh, electrodynamics. So this is a theory, as you all know, is formulated by Dirac, Pauli, Dunn, uh, Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga. And it is the simplest theory with just two parameters as a mass of the electron, it could also be the mass of the muon, doesn't matter. And alpha, which is a Sommerfeld fine structure constant. And today, of course, QED can extend to all other charged particles. And the tau leptons, the tau is an even heavier cousin of the muon and the charged quarks. So as we mentioned earlier, the free electron satisfies the Dirac equation. Sitting deep inside the Dirac equation actually is the magnetic moment. 
And then the G factor, which is the gyromagnetic ratio. So there are two meanings to the gyromagnetic ratio I'm using, using it for this one. G equals two being the classical prediction of the Dirac theory. So in quantum field theory, we have what are known as loops and we can compute this set of orders uh, in the loop expansion. So essentially you can think heuristically as the loop, each loop representing the popping out of let's say an electron positron pair out of the vacuum, then it does its work and then pops back into the vacuum. Okay. So what this does is for instance in QED, there are three different effects because of these loops. One is called a vacuum polarization. So it changes the properties of the electron itself and kind of screens the charge of the electron. The other is called the self energy of the electron. And the third is called the vertex correction. So having to deal with these is what is known as the program of renormalization that is done after regularizing the theory. Okay. Now you may say that these are all mathematical uh, tricks, but it's not true. All of them have observable effects. For instance, the self energy of the electron leads to what is known as the Lamb shift, which is the splitting of lines in hydrogen. In fact, it's not just the self energy, but there's something called a Euling term, which is caused by vacuum polarization, which along with the self energy correction leads to the Lamb shift, okay? And finally, there's the vertex correction, which actually is the effect that leads to the departure from the classically expected value of two for the gyromagnetic ratio. So all three of these are experimentally accessible through the lamp shift. The lamp shift probes both the vacuum polarization and the self energy of the electron, whereas the vertex correction actually probes the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron and the muon as the case may be. Okay, so I don't know if this is visible, but let me read this out. So this is a paper from Physical Review in 1948 by two authors, Cush and Foley. And it's called the magnetic moment of the electron. It's called the magnetic moment of the electron. And actually, if you go down and see this, you see that it already produces for you, I had asked you to remember this number 116. Now you already begin to see this over here in this measurement in 1948, which is 73 years ago, based on atomic spectra, they had already started to see this. So here they see this 1.00119, you see, I had asked you to remember the number 116, but you see the very first experiment that looked at this particular effect had already seen that this is, Point one one nine. Now, who is Kush? It's, it's very interesting. This is Polycarp who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the lamp shift, along with Willis Lamb, of course. So, even though it's called the lamp shift, the Nobel Prize was awarded to, to two persons, uh, Willis Lamb as well as Polycarp Kush, the great experiment. So, it's amazing. So, Kush was involved in the lamp shift. In other words, this person who discovered both. Uh, vacuum polarization as well as the self energy of the electron. But he is also the person who's discovered the vacuum polarization. All the three effects of QED at one loop essentially detected in atomic physics experiments. See? So, loosely speaking, now I'm just moving to the muon because later on it turned out that it's easier to do experiments with muon and electrons. But any possibility of finding a uh, a deviation from the standard model. The muon is a better laboratory than the electron because its mass is much higher. Therefore, there are pre-factors in all these effects which are enhanced by the presence of the muon mass. That's the reason why there is such a huge experimental effort to look at the, oh, the G minus to the muon and not just the muon, uh, G minus to the So at the level of the QED correction, it is independent of the mass of the particle. That's the reason why that number that I showed you, 0 0.00119, may as well have been for the muon. It is independent of this. So loosely speaking, so this is the coupling of the muon to the external photon over here. And this vertex here is supposed to be probing the G equals two. 
And all the G minus two comes from the dressing of the muon because of various activities going on in the vacuum or corrections to the G minus two sitting in this blob over here. Uh, is this all making uh, sense? Ayan, am I okay? Am I audible? Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, is perfect, the meeting perfect. going okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah perfect. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of spooky to be talking this to yeah. this yeah, little yeah. green eye. So I just thought that I would ask you. So if you wish, you can also stop and ask questions. Maybe uh, take questions in between. In okay, sure. Uh, so uh, may, I'll say a little bit more and then maybe I can stop and see if there are any questions. So that was as far as the theory was, con the experiment was concerned 1948, but obviously this measurement had already reached the ears of theorists. And uh, the first experimental, the first theory calculation was done by Schwinger and published here, I think this was 1947 over here, received on December 20th, 1947. And this is his Nobel prize winning paper that you see over here. Um, Thank you for telling me about preview. It is so much better than ActorRead. Because when I was trying to do this, Apple Plus and ActorRead, all the stuff was moving to the right and off the screen. So anyway, so here is his result and published in uh, less than two columns of physical review. So this is the paper on quantum electrodynamics and the magnetic moment of the electron. Where he does this calculation and gives this answer over here, which is E squared pi divided by two. So today we express it slightly differently. We write it as alpha by two pi, which is exactly the same thing, where alpha is e squared by four pi, okay? And you can see the number popping up over here again, 0 0.001162. So this is the great, great calculation of Schwinger, where he actually evaluated this. In fact, this is a finite correction. If one does this, <coughs> you don't actually need to do regularization, renormalization and so on, because it's a finite correction. So this is this amazing what he does over here uh, as for the departure from e minus two over here to one loop in QED and that's the answer. Okay, I should do an apple zero. I should do an apple plus over there. And, uh, and this is a picture of his uh, headstone. Uh, so he passed away in 1994, and I guess this must be his wife uh, who passed away somewhat later. And um, his epitaph uh, carries the expression alpha by two i. You know, I think it's only very lucky people who get such impressive epitaphs. It could be uh, Boltzmann who has rather interesting epitaph and Schwinger. So I just thought that I'd put this here for and. Human interest to be over here. So that is G minus two at leading order in QED. So we can ask ourselves, how can we understand this? What is the basic principle from which we understand in a physical way, why the G minus two must be corrected in the first place? As I said, at one loop, it is finite and it was computed to be alpha by two pi. Now recall that alpha is a number which is one by 137, one by 137 point something. I think even students know this. So, of course, in all field theories, coupling constants, run, but the value of alpha that you have over here is a low energy value, which is extracted from the Thomson cross section. So, this is like the infrared extreme of QED, where alpha is a measurable and has to be obtained from experiment, and it's from the Thomson cross section. So, it is 1 by 137 divided by 2 pi is this number that I keep mentioning, 0 0.00116. So loop speaking, the reason why there are vac vacuum fluctuations, you can try to understand it as a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where very small uh, time scales and fluctuations in time can have a large fluctuation in the energy, and therefore you can have production of particle pairs from the vacuum. Okay? And therefore, if you probe things at higher and higher precision, you have the possibility of producing larger and larger fluctuations. So that's the reason why at very high precision, you have a chance of seeing particles that are very massive that you would not otherwise see, except under very specific laboratory conditions. Okay. So here on the scale, I try to argue for why we should be prepared for higher order uh, contributions. So we can think of a loop as resulting from fluctuations of particle pairs in the vacuum. 
And once these particle pairs are produced, they will also have their interactions, again, dictated by the laws of the theory of strong interactions and so on. So you will have fluctuations, not just of electrons and positron pairs, but you could have fluctuations of pairs of quarks, pairs of heavy leptons. You could have uh, fluctuations where the W boson jumps out of the vacuum, the W boson being the force carrier of the, uh, of the weak interactions could also pop out. Each one of these things is going to cause a correction to the G minus two. So that is the reason how the G minus two becomes a sensitive probe of the structure of our theory itself. And then we have rules, of course, the way in which we organize the group expansion. There are powers of electric charge associated with each vertex. There are powers of, let us say, the weak coupling constant, if you produce a W out of the vacuum. And as position uh, increases, we have higher and higher loops, which need to be accounted for. And as I mentioned, even though the series in alpha is divergent, we need to compute it, at least at this product. We have electroweak uh, loops, then we have uh, loops with quarks, which obviously cannot be computed in quantum chromodynamics because quantum chromodynamics permits an expansion of the strong constant only in the ultraviolet because the theory there is asymptotically free. At lower energies, it has to be modeled using experimental information, for instance, E plus E minus, producing other hadronic particles and then again disappearing back into the vacuum. So we have to use data from the equals So what happens here, the contest between theory and experiment is a high precision measurement that is being done by Fermilab on the one hand and high precision calculations using more and more loops, modeling data better and better and so on. And what if there are interactions beyond the standard model? Would they also make an appearance? We would say yes. So, but of course, in those interactions are all we can do is try to fit them in the gap between theory and experiment. So that's how the G minus two also becomes a probe of beyond the standard model interactions. And what are these beyond the standard model interactions? Could it be supersymmetry? So which model of supersymmetry? Could there be extra dimensions? If so, which excitations of the extra dimensions pop in and correct the G minus two? So those are the theoretical challenges that we face. Each time I'm having to click on this. So here is a sample of the representative corrections that we have. This is from the physical review letter publication of the Fermi collaboration E891. What is it? E981, I can't remember which. You see various diagrams that you have, which are here. This is the QED. Here is the electroweak. Here is a hedonic vacuum polarization. And here is a hadronic light by light scattering. This is what is called light by light scattering. In QED, light by light scattering was described by Delbruck and it's called Delbruck scattering, who's a Nobel laureate, not in physics, but in biology. So he did his work here and then moved to biology. So here's a sample of QED diagrams from the paper of Ioma et al. that I, uh, I cited earlier. Look at the kinds of diagrams that they have over here. There are millions of diagrams, but eventually, all these things are done on supercomputers and added up. They produce what are called master integrals, some of which have to be evaluated numerically, all the results put together and added, and then they have many ways of cross-checking their results. You know, this also, this is done in a gauge theory with a gauge parameter. They look for cancellations of the gauge parameter. It's a whole subject in itself. So returning again to the results. So this is where we have these results that I was telling you about. So this is the Brookhaven uh, result that was sent at 2080 or so. Keep an eye on the scale. Now this is to test our mental abilities, I think in mathematics, how to, how to move decimal points around. So at one place it is written as 218, at another place it's written as 2080, another place it's written as 21.0. So this is all mental mathematics, which at IIT is no problem. All of you have gone to Kota or you have students from Kota, so you know exactly how to go back and forth, moving zeros and so on all over the place. So this is in units of 10 to the power of nine. So this was a Brookhaven result, peaked at 2080. This is the new Fermi lab result, which is peaked at 2040, as you can see over here. 
Whereas the standard model prediction, the white paper after they have done all their work and gathered everything is sitting over here. As I said, it has peaked at about 18, zero something over here. And this is the uncertainty. So this is the green band, which is the theoretical uncertainty. And this is the combined band of uncertainty for Brookhaven and Fermilab. As I said, the Brookhaven and the Fermilab results, they are consistent with each other. The central values are quite, diff quite different, but within the errors, of course they agree. So if you average this using various statistical methods, you get a total experimental average over here. And this is the 4.6 sigma that everybody talks about, this white gap over here between the green and this color, whatever it is, magenta color that is over here. A little bit about the experiments and their history. There were CERN experiments in the 1960s with large uncertainty, but they all have essentially the same principles. The Brookhaven lab uh, experiment E821, end of the last century and early part of this century, and finally, you have the Fermilab non g experiment, which is ongoing and attempts to reduce the uncertainty by a factor of four. So the Fermilab non g 2 experiment got a start. The Brookhaven experiment over here, Long Island, used a magnet and did all its work, and then it was shut down. And then uh, Fermilab said that it would do the same experiment, move the magnet from Brookhaven to Fermilab, but by road, it would have been an impossible task. So what they did was to dismantle the magnet and then put it on a barge, and ships in barge and so on. And then it went from the Atlantic around the Gulf of Mexico, up into the Mississippi all the way. And then a small part of it was covered by road. So this happened, I think about eight, nine years ago. So this was called the big move of the magnet. This is the magnet after it has been assembled. It has a diameter of about 50, 50 feet over here. It's a rather large magnet. And this is the experiment. So the principle of the experiment is to inject a beam of very pure, highly polarized muons into this and just allow the muons to circulate over here. And since they are polarized, when they decay, they will actually go lose their energy and move into the annulus of the ring, and then they would be detected. That's the principle of this experiment, is to have very pure polarized muons injected into the ring, which go all the way around. As long as the muon is not decayed, it'll stay in this orbit. And when it decays, it loses, the, the electron now has less energy than what the muon had, and so it no longer meets the cyclotron condition, and therefore it leaves the annular region and then moves and leaves the magnet and moves into the annular region because it is less energetic, it spirals in and is detected. <clears throat> so, this, so the principle was just this, both at Brookhaven and at Fermi Lab. The storage ring in which pawns circulate at what is called a magic energy, and I'll tell you what this magic energy is. And how are these muons produced? Well, they are produced from pion decay. And pions themselves are always produced in all high energy physics laboratories. They can be produced just in you know, brute force uh, collisions. Whenever you take a target and hit it with some energetic particles, it produces a large number of pions. And these pions, which are made up of quarks and antiquarks, UD bar over here, for instance, uh, they are all collected. And then the pion preferentially decays into a muon and its neutrino can also decay into an electron, but it's down by a factor of 10 to the minus three. So these muons that are produced. And because once again, let me emphasize that because this is a weak decay and the weak decays are maximally parity violating, these are highly polarized muons that are produced when you look at them in the direction of the flight of the pions. Okay, so the muons are naturally polarized in the direction of the flight. And highly relativistic pions, when they decay, the muons are also produced in the same direction and they are produced and they are polarized in the same direction. And then these muons, of course, decay. Here it's a mu plus, decays into a positron and a neutrino and an anti muon, <clears throat> like this. So, what happens is that these are kept in a highly uniform magnetic field. 
highly unique. So there's a uniform magnetic field inside these, inside the ring over here, pointing up in the, in the Z direction, let's say. So let us say that the ring lies in the XY plane, and let us say that the Z axis is normal to the plane in which the, uh, normal to the plane in which the annulus is present. And the magnetic field is a very uniform magnetic field inside this blue region, which is all pointing in the Z direction. And it's the purity of the magnetic field that is very key to the precision of this measurement. So this uniform magnetic field in which the muon polarization vector processes. And then the decay of the muon is seen by any falling positron and correlated with polarization by an array of 24 Cherenkov detectors. So it's like this. So here is the magnetic field that we said over here. And if you have a polarized muon like this, the polarized muon will process over here. Just because it has a magnetic moment, it processes over here with a certain precession frequency, okay? It has a certain precession frequency over here. But in our example, what we'll have is that this muon will also will be, the polarization will also be lying in the XY plane. Here it is shown at an arbitrary angle theta that is between the direction of the magnetic field and the polarization uh, direction. Our polarization axis will actually lie in the XY plane over here, and then that will process around. And that's the principle of this experiment, okay? So once again, I've said all these things in words. So once again, you can see what happens. So the protons, so this was in Brookhaven, AGS alternating gradient synchrotron. These protons would hit the target, produce pions. The pions would produce muons, and then these would enter the ring, and then they would process round over here. And when them decays, it is then leaves and moves into the annular region and is detected by a Cherenkov detector, like so. One of the improvements at the Fermi lab, from what I understand, is that they no longer have what is called a pion or a proton flash. That is, they have the purity of the beam is improved to such an extent that you don't have any contamination with undecayed pions and undecayed protons that may accidentally enter into the ring over here and then worsen your signal. So they have improved the technology to such an extent that they have no hadronic flash at all. And only what enters over here are polarized muons over here. <clears throat> I had mentioned something called the magic energy. So let me try to tell you a little bit of, about the story of this particular map. Magic energy. Okay. So, what happens is that this precession of this uh, that comes in, supposing there had been no uh, anomalous magnetic moment at all, then the period of the motion of the muon would be exactly equal to the precession time that the muon's polarization vector also takes. They would be locked with each other. It's only because of the presence of this anomalous magnetic moment over here that the polarization vector of the muon begins to go out of phase with the motion of the muon in the ring itself. So there are two vectors over here. One is the vector of the momentum that is going around, and the other is the vector of the precession of the polarization. So it's the presence of this uh, anomalous magnetic moment, which becomes multiplied by the magnitude of the magnetic field, which is responsible for this thing going out of phase to produce a precession frequency for the uh, muon relative to the frequency of the motion of the muon itself. Now here you have this charged particle in this ring, in this annular region that is moving in this magnetic field. But in order to keep this thing in orbit, you also have, need to have an electric field and that's the second term over here. The second term is needed to keep the muons in motion in, in the cyclotron orbit over here. But the problem is to have a very highly pure electric field. This measurement of this omega A is what is going to give you information of this A mu, which is what you want to measure. But in order to do that, if there is a contamination from the electric field also, then your measurement may go bust. So the notion of this magic energy comes from trying to cancel out the effect of the electric field, which you don't actually control very well. 
This third term here is something called the pitch, which has no problem because it involves only the B field, okay, which is very accurately known. So that is no problem. The measurements of the magnetic field actually is very important in this particular experiment, how they measure and control the magnitude of this magnetic field. So in order to get rid of this contribution, you tune the energy of the muon, which is sitting in the gamma over here. So this is the Lorentz factor gamma, which is in the Lorentz transformation, in such a way as to cancel this particular term. And that is where this magic energy comes from. So once again, plugging in our favorite numbers over here into this equation, again, back to 0, 0, 1, 1, 6, 1, 4, 1, et cetera, you will find that if you choose your energy to be 3.10 GeV, this is the magic energy, this particular term cancels out. So this is the brilliance of this experiment, is to be able to control this magic energy in such a way so that this contribution goes away. And from a very accurately known B field and measurement of this omega A, you get a very good measurement, precise measurement of A mu. Please note, at this kind of a Lorentz boost, I'd already mentioned one of the early slides that the lifetime of the muon is of the order of two microseconds. But with this enormous Lorentz boost over here, its lifetime actually is 64 microseconds. Okay? So you see, so that will determine the number of uh, times this muon goes around in that particular ring, whose diameter you know is about 50, 50 feet. You also know what its velocity is. Over here, you know what its lifetime is. So how many cycles are possible for a given, uh, you know, a packet of muons that is injected into the ring, how long it will go around. So this is the beauty of this particular experiment. And from the measurement of the decay electrons that go into the annular region, from that you can actually figure out the uh, radiate the uh, the radiative decay law that you have over here, over there, and from that get the object of information of uh, interest to you, which is omega a, and eventually get a mu from there. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so this is basically what I wanted to say about this experiment. The energy and the timing information are known about the muons, the muons that are injected, and the resulting uh, electrons and positrons that are measured by the Cherenkov detectors sitting inside the annular region. And Anand, then they plot the data. Anand, yeah. Can I ask something? Yes, of course. Uh, what is the precision to which the energy of the muon is known? Uh, I mean, of the beam, I mean. Yes, it's a, it's a very good question. I think I have to look at those papers. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't kept track uh, of okay. that. Then it's fine. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's, it's rather well known. This magic energy has been known for a while. So it's tuned in such a way as to get rid of that contribution of the electric field. So these are what are called spin equations. These are very well known. And, and uh, they know how to account for all these things and detailed simulations of these things. They know how to do it. So the key thing that they extract and they plot the data is in something called the wiggle plot that I will show you of the energy spectrum of the electrons that are seen by these Cherenkov detectors. There's another beautiful principle that is associated with that. So if the muon is actually uh, pointing exactly towards the detector and the electron is detected, then the most energetic electrons are detected in the direction of the muon uh, polarization, but since the muon is also is also processing at the time at the instant when it decays, if the muon is not pointing towards the detector, then the electron that is seen will have less energy. So that is how they actually see the precession of the muon. The energy spectrum of the received electrons or the detected electrons actually tell you exactly where the muon. Uh, polarization was pointing at that particular instant. So that's the reason why the energy and the timing information is really needed. So supposing the muon is pointing exactly backwards at the instant when it decayed, that's when you get the least energetic electrons at the detector. So the energy of the electron that is detected is modulated by the precession of the muon. And that is the, again, the basic principle. So these are the various uh, aspects of the, of the experiment that I have written down over here. 
So using all these facts, like uh, possession of the parity violating detection, and the fact that there is a correlation between the energy of the doctor electron and the uh, direction in which the electron is produced, they reconstruct exactly how the decays take place. And from that, they pull out the uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. So these are the details of what I call the wiggle plot, which I will show in the next page. Here's an example of the wiggle plot over here. So you can see over here. So this says time after injection modulo 102.5 seconds. So what you see over here is wherever this plot here ends, the top one is where it starts over here on this log scale. So there's a very clever way of organizing the data. On the, on the log scale, on the y-axis, you always see, you see over here. <clears throat> so each of these things you have to be able to read. Where this thing ends is where this thing starts and where this thing ends again, this thing starts and so on. So this is on the same overlay, they have the entire information of the decay. So again, because this is a log plot, you don't see the exponential decay law on this log plot. And you can see the modulation <coughs> of the number of electrons received after the, after the decay. I have reasons for plotting it in this particular way. But this is the reason, what I just explained a few seconds ago, is why this thing gets modulated by the precession of the electron. So this is the principle of the, of the experiment from which we have a very accurate measurement, which I have shown on the earlier slides. So these are the publications. The first one is the uh, muon G minus two of the Brookhaven. And then there were four publications released on the 7th of April. One of them was published in physical review letters, which gives you the number. Where is that one? Yeah, the third one. Physical review letters is measurement of the positive muon anomalous magnetic moment to 0.46 ppm. And the others have to do with the beam dynamics and also the magnetic field measurement and also exactly how they do this precision frequency measurement. So these are the... So now let me turn uh, a little bit. Anand, uh, yes, may yes. I ask some question? Yes, yes, uh, yes, certainly, yes. Yeah. So this uh, decay time of the muon, muon would ultimately set uh, some kind of uh, fundamental precision to which we can actually set the magic energy, right? Uh, I think for the moment it is still limited by the uh, by the statistics, the number of muons that have actually been used. So you are asking whether there is a, a, a limitation coming from some kind of a clock precision. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. The decay time that should yeah. give uh, some uncertainty to the energy. Any, anyway. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. So the samples here are long enough, are, are large enough for you to have an actual exponential law. Okay. So it's not like you have a, such a small number of muons that you expect some Poissonian kind of distribution. They have millions of muons over here. So I don't no, think no. that that no, would that, be a limitation. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's that the energy of a decaying particle is not well-defined, right? It has a natural width. So, uh, so you have ah, to- that, that would be more uh, in, in, in hadronic decays. Here, you're just calculating it from a Feynman diagram from the muon. Okay, in that case, you can do it to the, to, to the next level in the, uh, in the decay of the muon in QED with electroweak and so on. I think that that part is not the difficulty. So that's not what is the main uncertainty to the experiment? No, 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 no. That is not where it is coming from. The main uncertainty still comes from the sample sizes and probably the precision to which the V field is known. Okay. Okay. I mean, what you're asking, of course, would be some absolute limitation on their precision, yeah. but uh, it is not clear to me, at least nobody has discussed that uh, at the oh. level of precision desired. Uh, it could have some bearing maybe, you know, when they gather more yeah. statistics, yeah. whether you have a deviation from an exponential law. Yeah. No, no, that's a very important question, but I don't know the answer. Okay, Sorry, so now I, I turn to, how am I doing for time? Probably very badly, right? 
Uh, no, actually, you have 10 minutes. If, is it, oh. uh, or you can take a little bit more. Yeah, maybe so I started... take a bit more. Yeah, I maybe okay. I take a okay. bit more. So let me tell you now about the, about the experimental, now about the theory part. So here are various plots again, uh, where we have various contributions. So this is the hedonic vacuum polarization. You must have heard a lot of excitement that the lattice seems to find no difficulty because there's a paper published in Nature by this collaboration, which is the Budapest, Marseille, Wuppertal uh, collaboration. So that is the line that is over here. So this is a lattice calculation. Uh, the lattice calculation that was uh, adopted by the white paper folks is also a lattice is also over here with much larger precision. So this BMW collaboration, the lattice guys, they claim to have much higher precision and that's where the dispute is as far as the lattice is concerned. So the white paper people are over here with this dark line over here at the bottom. These are other people who have computed hedonic vacuum polarization. Here is a group Davie et al. This is Keshav Zari et al. And, but the white paper has this 4.2 sigma deviation as I mentioned. So the white paper comes various theoretical uncertainties. So this is the hedronic vacuum polarization at leading order, next to leading order, next to next to leading order. So here is the lattice guys, which uh, is not fully included. Here is the hedronic light by light contribution that comes from phenomenology and then various contributions to this phenomenology. This can also be evaluated separately on the lattice that is also given over here. I told you that the main bulk of the answer of the contribution comes from QED. But you can see the uncertainty in QED is very small over here. So that's not where the problem is. The problem is the uncertainties over here in these things. Okay. The electroweak, all these are quite well known. And the total standard model value that I told you, 1810, that you see over here with uncertainty of 43. Whereas the E821, that was the, uh, those guys at uh, Brookhaven was this number 2089 uncertainty of 63. Okay. So as I mentioned, now there's also one more experiment which is proposed at J-Park, which is based on ultra cold muons and not on these muons circulating in a ring. And as I mentioned earlier, the uncertainties here come from leading hadronic vacuum polarization and especially from the low energy region. Essentially a diagram of the sort where a virtual photon over here splits up into hadrons mainly pi plus pi minus at the low energies and then again fuses back to give you a photon and this is where the uncertainty is living over there. Now from unitarity and analogicity you can get information on <coughs> this particular contribution by measurements of e plus e minus going to pi plus pi minus. A large number of experiments for 40, 50, 60 years which have gathered information on e plus e minus going to pi plus pi minus. Why is that of, of importance to us? Supposing you cut this diagram over here, you have an E plus E minus producing the photon, which goes into pi plus pi minus. The same thing here is a mirror reflection of the same thing and then they fuse together, okay? Therefore, from unitarity, which is a statement that, that you know, uh, it, is a, it is an expression of the optical theorem, which tells you that the total cross section is related to the imaginary part of the forward cross section. So you can use unitarity to be able to relate this particular contribution by ions to what you actually measure in the laboratory of E plus E minus going to pi plus pi minus, even though part of it goes into the vacuum and goes back into the vacuum. There is a large Does number of matter? experiments. Does it matter that the pi ions are virtual while the experiments are real pi ions, Marshall? No, uh, everybody, we know how to do these things. We know how ah, to okay. introduce into a kernel of, of, of a contribution and to integrate over all possibilities, over all, all these properties are taken care of. This is well-known science, more than okay. 50 okay. years. Okay. Yeah. So there are this experiment, this is called Chloe. It's an experiment at Fascati. Then there's Babar, uh, which is um, experiment in the US. There's also Bell of which uh, Jim and others are, are members. And I think you have one more colleague who's a member of this. There are also other experiments, Beijing, BES, and some experiments in Novosibirsk, which also produce data, okay? So the main thing is that the pion is an object over here that is of interest to us. It is 
a composite particle made up of U and D quarks. So essentially you have an E plus E minus colliding producing a virtual photon. And then that produces U quarks and D quarks uh, because they have uh, the correct charges to, to combine with these things. So E plus E minus going five plus five minus going. And uh, of course, all the dynamics of the strong interactions are present because at the level of drawing a Feynman diagram, you would, you would draw it with quarks. But these quarks hadronize because of the presence of the strong interactions. And what you need is detailed experimental information coming from this particular sector. Okay. So here we have to be able to model this information, take this information properly, and then evaluate these hadronic contributions. Since I'm really short of time over here, I won't say very much except to show you the slides where I explain in great detail what are all the properties of scattering amplitudes that we use in order to reliably estimate these quantities. Okay. So this is the basic theory uh, slide that I have, which will explain to you how we use the optical theorem, how we use what is called the analyticity properties of these scattering amplitudes as functions of complex energies, and then how we model this information in a sensible way to evaluate these contributions. Okay. So, since the pion is a composite particle, it doesn't just couple to a photon through the electric charge. It couples through what is called a form factor. And the form factor contains the information. It's a phenomenological object that contains the information of how these quarks form bound states. Okay. So that is this F of T over here, which is what is known as a form factor, which is directly related to the experimentally observed cross section by E plus E minus two pi plus pi minus. Therefore, the low energy hadronic vacuum polarization contributions to the G minus two of the muon appears in a function like this. So it's an integral from one lower energy to a higher energy, where these energies have to do with the threshold of the production for such particles. There are all well-known functions which account for initial state radiation, final state radiation, all kinds of other effects because you know, in nature, you can't switch off these interactions that they're always present. So these are all known functions that we can use and evaluate this particular thing. If you know this F of T to high precision, this form factor has to be known to high precision for you to get a reliable estimate of what the, what the hedonic vacuum polarization contributions are to the G minus two. <coughs> Okay, so I don't want to say much more except to more or less tell you how one gets a good handle on F of T, the form factor to sufficiently high precision. Ah, this is the only thing that is working. It's the uh, mouse that works and not the up and down keys. Uh, you can you have to go to the settings and send it to scroll mode. Ah, rather than... <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so this is where we have done some of the work uh, along with Sunetra and many of our co-workers, students, Irinel Caprini is one of the leaders of our collaboration, where we have tried to improve the precision of these determinations of these form factors. So our work has been to use uh, information on the form factor in regions where it is very well known and to extrapolate it to regions where it is not so well known and to minimize the uncertainties using various methods of mathematical physics to be able to use statistical simulations uh, using this particular theory. Uh, so here is a paper of which Sunetra is also an author, my goodness, already 10 years ago, where we have described the formalism that is required in order to make this theory very predictive. So let me skip over this and let me just go to the results because I think I'm almost in negative time now. Oh, I have to do both. Okay, so in our work, what we have done is that we have estimated the contributions to the G minus two from the low energy pi plus pi minus hydronic contributions. And our key result sits in this last line over here, where this is a number where the uncertainty was more than one. 
whereas we were able to knock this down to a little less than one and improve the uncertainty in this particular contribution from the threshold to m pi to an energy like 0.63 GeV, we were able to improve the precision. Okay. Many other people have also done these things, and this is where our work was actually of some use. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I have a question about that upper limit. Yes. Where is the upper limit coming from? And, and is this just assumed to be safe that you've integrated over all the big contributions? Uh, I don't hear very well. Could you just uh, type in your question in the chat? Maybe Not I can see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm waiting to hear or to read. Uh, I think Jim was asking about the upper limit, where it is coming ah, from. Ah, the upper limit. Why is there an upper limit? Oh, it, it is just. Uh, see the way in which we are interested in is, is is sort of a way in which we are binning all this information in some regions where the experimental information is not very much consistent different experiments are seeing slightly different values for the form factor there's an energy that is chosen sort of below a region where the data are all consistent to see what the uncertainties are then there's a separate integration from that 0.63 up to about the row where <clears throat> the cross sections are more or less in agreement with each other. So it is a kind of uh, an energy up to where things are not very clear. So it is just an arbitrary choice, uh, but guided by the fact that Bell and Chloe don't agree very well with each other up till about those energies. Uh, does it answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. I, yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> so I won't say much more except to uh, except now uh, to say that this is what we have done in our work for the hedonic uh, uh, vacuum polarization. I can also say a few words now about uh, the hedonic light by light scattering. So earlier until about, let's say about two or three years ago, most of the hedonic light by light scattering information came from models, uh, you know, from theory, from inputs like that, normally because of the coupling of various particles present in those final states. But a new dispersive calculation by these authors has put these determinations on a much more kind of uh, solid footing where it's completely data-driven well, as far as possible. There are some assumptions. And then uh, it kind of supersedes these model calculations, essentially in agreement, but I think the uncertainties are now better known. So, um, so this is a slide that tells you a little bit about the hedonic light by light uh, information. Uh, so these are the various contributions coming from there. And uh, the white paper, for instance, over here, it tells you that the uh, hedonic light by light contributions in these units or whatever it is, as the central value is 92 with an uncertainty of 19. This is somewhat significantly better than earlier uncertainties that you see over here. For instance, 100 with an uncertainty of 28. Their goal is to come down to an uncertainty of about 10% rather than the present 20%. Let me go back here. Oops, control plus. I think I'm a real dummy at the use of this. Uh, yeah, I probably need to go full screen or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, so I'm more or less at my end of my talk. Uh, situation of the atomic light by light. What happened to my summary slide? Okay, so this was more or less my summary slide where in the previous, uh, I don't know how I got the order of the summary and this mixed up. Okay, 
so one of them was a summary of our work where I talked about um, improvements of the hedonic vacuum polarization. I do not see much of a possibility that the theory numbers can change very much. All this hedonic vacuum polarization is essentially, there's no wiggle room anymore. The light by light, maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room, but that could only bring down the uncertainties a little bit, but unlikely that the central value will change very much. So the main controversy that uh, Ian wanted me to mention was about this lattice. And I'd already mentioned to you right in one of the early slides that the BMW collaboration gives this number, which is rather close to the experimental number with significantly reduced uh, uncertainties. So I think that um, some other lattice collaborations also have to start producing numbers consistent with BMW. The white paper has quoted lattice figures with much larger uncertainties. But the BMW folks are uh, very confident. They go to conferences and they are very uh, certain about their uh, results. So that's the situation where today we have the theory based on hydronic vacuum and uh, light by light scattering, which produces a number and errors which are significantly smaller than what the experiment is seeing. Now, if the experiment run two and run three continue and they confirm the experimental result, then I think we have a serious problem here. Uh, so that's the situation as far as I can see. So I think I'll stop the share over here and see if there are any questions that we can take. Thanks, Anand, for this amazing talk. Uh, very comprehensive and, uh, and very oh, covered a lot of stuff. So let's have questions. So there is already a raised hand. Uh, Jim, please. Yeah, can you hear me now? I've changed my yes. mic. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, so yeah, I, I had two questions. One on the lattice. Okay. So with the BMW collaboration, is there a more well-known hadronic parameter that they can benchmark their techniques against to prove that their calculation is appropriate, right? Because they just quote for the hadronic vacuum polarization, but I'm wondering if there's a, a benchmark test they could do to show that. Uh, I, 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 I would have to look at some of the talks okay. and read the paper and get back to you in a day or two. Because I, I, I've not seen anything like that. They just talk about what they- I don't do think very... it's, it's really accepted. Yeah. The community is not very really pleased with that particular result. So, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just no, no, know. it doesn't mean that. No. Okay, so there's just, it's going to be a lot of work to yes, this. yes. Then, um, actually, on on Bell two, um, we've just started to work on the e plus e minus to pi pi gamma to okay. do a new measurement because. Uh, I know that the bar and the Chloe measurements disagree with one another around the region of the rho m regular interference, right? There's yes. this discrepancy. So we, we plan to remeasure doing the Babar technique, but I'm also wondering if there are other pieces of information you on the theory side would like from Bell 2, aside from new measurement of the plus e minus pi pi gamma cross section uh, or the form factor. Yeah. I don't know, maybe there is a little problem also, maybe with the rho omega mixing, perhaps. There could be maybe some wiggle room there with the rho omega mixing. Uh, I, it is very difficult to, I think if you people could uh, uh, settle the controversies between Chloe and uh, Babar measurements, that may be a very good goal to see whether you agree with one or the other or with neither. So that I think would be a very useful okay. that, that, that that is our goal at the moment. Yeah. We will have a larger data set than Babar by next yes. summer, and then yeah. we will do the analysis on that data. Okay. And we will see. But it's a very difficult analysis, as you may yes. well know. So yeah. it will take some time. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah we're, we're working on it. Okay. Thank you. Wasn't okay. there one more question? Bashkaran has a question. Maybe he can ask himself or yeah, read it out. Sure. Do you hear me? Uh, but very faintly. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? I can, yes. 
So that was a lot of noise. Yeah. People are looking for failure of standard model. In the no, I can't hear you. You may have to increase your volume. Oh, I did. Uh... No. So maybe hear. I read out the question or? Yeah, yes, yeah. I oh, read okay. out the question. Yeah. yeah so, the spec so the question is, if there is any speculation where standard model might fail, whether it will be new, new particles or you have modifications of standard model parameters? It's impossible to say because, you know, a theory that's working so well everywhere. I know that there's a discrepancy in P physics in a particular channel K to P to K star L plus L minus and so on. Uh, most probably it'll, that will also be some experimental result reason. There is no way you can understand why there should be new physics sitting here and nowhere else. And this is at a very low energy. This is at the mass of the muon, which is like orders of magnitude below the mass of the uh, W, for instance. There has to be some something that was missed for one reason or another, or maybe there's E plus E minus measurements. Maybe there's something a bit strange about them. Or maybe there's something in the experiment that has been missed. That's my, my view. I mean, yes, you can have any exotic model which can explain anything. If you have as many uh, parameters as you have measurements, yeah, there's only one measurement that way. Just one number. <laughs> so, so probably one has to see in the form factor whether they can be modifications because there you have a lot of measurements of many energies why things may not be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I think it says here a new message. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so more questions then? Maybe from students? Ah, there is something. Sure, go ahead, Sri Hari. You can. Hi Anand, Sri Hi. Hari here. Hi, hi. How are you? Good, good. Um, so, uh, sorry, maybe you said this, but uh, um, how do you get the light by light scattering from data? I missed that one. Is that also from E plus E minus to E plus E minus, or is that? No, no. It's it's, it's very complicated business. They have a lot of channels that they have to add, and there are, you know. The, the, if you look, if you read the paper, they have all kinds of form factors and uh, you know Lorentz structures that appear because there's a large number of particles there. So it's it's a very complicated thing. So I don't know exactly how they do it, but it is it uses various pieces of data in order to do it. Those mainly, papers are very comprehensive. Really. I think it's mainly from two photon in E plus E minus. You have to use the two photon. Uh, collisions that come with E plus E minus, and then you look at the light by light scattering that takes place in yes. photon collisions. But I completely agree, I've never quite understood when people present this how they combine everything together. Sorry, is maybe, that maybe I can look at it and send an email uh, trying to understand exactly what is done and send you an email. Yeah, uh, and I can look at the papers that you had in the reference. Yeah, yeah, the white paper itself, uh, okay. they will have a lot of uh, references that will tell you how it is done. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I can make a comment here. So one of my collaborators works on this light by light scattering, Tony yes. Ribbon. He also yeah. gave a talk at IMSC on this. So I think his, so there are some, uh, the, 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 the difficulty with models is that is most of them don't satisfy the short distance Melnikov, Wallenstein, and some other yeah, constants yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you would chiral Lagrange, you know, this kind of phenomenological models. So, so he started using this uh, first Sakai Sugimoto type models and then just very bland holographic QCD models bottom up, which has only a few parameters that you fix with experiment. And they seem to reproduce this experimental data on, the, on this uh, thing very well. And, uh, and this has been also, I think this is going to be part of this new white paper business. Yes. That, yeah, yeah. that is going to reduce this uncertainties yeah. on, on this uh, computations. Yes. But as you say, maybe this is not the most uh, important effect. The most yeah. important thing that is in the first one, which, yeah. which 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 is much which which probably can be settled by the lattice in yes. principle of the case. But but uh, do you think the lattice in principle should be able to settle it at some point? If not, uh, maybe uh, uh, like in next year, mm -hmm. but maybe after like 30, 40 years. 
Now, you know, we don't know if there is one or two more lattice groups who are also finding the same thing, then we have to accept that it's true. The other thing is, of course, since both Brookhaven and Fermi Lab are uh, based on the same principle, maybe there is some uh, systematic thing that has been missed. Who knows? It's unlikely because you're talking about some really serious experiments over here. So the J-Park, which is based on ultra-cold muons, if it is sanctioned and then they do a measurement, and that's different from this, then that would be very, very interesting. Right? So. Great. Okay, some questions, maybe uh, more uh, like more general questions or, uh, or other type of questions. So good, I mean, hope by that uh, you will come and visit us. And, uh, sure, sure, that would be my pleasure. Thanks a lot talk. for having me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and maybe on the Feynman diagrams that you're working on. And this. Yeah, 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 sure. sure. Thanks after Great. COVID and all. After COVID and all. So thank you very okay. much for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again. And thanks everybody for joining. Bye-bye. So, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.